Bigfoot, Bigfoot, roaming through the land. Bigfoot, Bigfoot, a hairy a black man. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Bigfoot Today, the show that's all about Bigfoot. I'm your host, Stephen Major, and with me once again is my co-host, Mitch the Man Johnson. How you doing, Mitch? Very well. Better than I have a right to. <laughs> Wonderful, man. Glad you could make it today. And I got to tell you, we've got a really exciting show lined up for you. Our special guest today is Michael Freeman, who is the son of the legendary Bigfoot researcher, Paul Freeman, who's going to share a lot of great stuff with us today. So you'll want to stick around. And we'll be right back right after this commercial break. This show is sponsored by Extreme Expeditions Northwest LLC, your gateway to adventure, specializing in guided Bigfoot expeditions to Alaska and throughout the Pacific Northwest and Canada. Well, welcome back, my friends. And now it's time for What's New in Bigfoot. Well, hey, Mitch, what's yeah. new? What's new? A lot of things. Uh, first off, I didn't get a card to him, so... Happy birthday to Bob Gimlin, who just turned 92 or 93. I can't wow. remember. Yeah. And, Didn't um, know it was his birthday. Yep. And, um, yeah, we'll both be there in 30 years. So yeah. <laughs> um, the last 30 were full of stuff, so I imagine the next 30 will yeah. be full of good stuff. Well, happy belated birthday, Bob. Sorry I missed it. Yep. And, um, yeah, and then really the newest thing that people probably aren't aware of is all, all of what you're up to. Um, you're going to be the, the king of the British Columbia coast um, coming up pretty soon. <laughs> As my dad used to say, the bull of the woods. But yep, there you go. Talk, and yeah. um, you've got a, a lot of good stuff that you're working on right now. And, um, yeah, it's good. Um, I mean, it's okay. I mean, I understand Arkansas and all this stuff, but... In my mind, having grown up in the Northwest, Sasquatch is, is kind of a coastal creature, but I know I allow for other things. It's just what I'm used to. You know, yeah. all, all my experiences were here in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, so anyway, I'm anxious to see what, what you come up with. Yeah, and I've got to tell you, thanks for bringing that up, because we do have a lot of exciting stuff coming up in 2023. It's going to be a stellar year for us at Extreme Expeditions Northwest in Bigfoot today. We're very pleased to announce that since Canada has recently lifted their COVID restrictions, we will be returning to the coast of BC here in May. Yeah. Uh, this May, we're going to be up there for a couple of weeks on an expedition, and we're also going to be shooting a new quasi-documentary autobiographical type mm -hmm. film. And I'm actually going to take you folks back to where I had my first encounter on yes. Huaskin Lake back in 1979. We're going to revisit that. And we're also going to go back into an area where we've had some recent sightings that a Sasquatch is still in that area. Sure. And uh, we're going to be doing that. And then following that up in on June 17th, uh, Saturday, June 17th, we're pleased to announce that the Spokane Valley Sasquatch Roundup is returning. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, that's June 17th at the Spokane Valley Event Center. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, we've got a heck of a lineup of speakers. We have Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. Uh, our guest, Michael Freeman, will be there. We have Cliff Berrickman. Uh, we have Michael Thompson, who's coming all the way down from Toke, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And we also have uh, a local guy. You've probably heard of him. He's the founder of Anomalous Investigations, Mr. Yeah. Charles Howard Johnson. Yep. And, and Ken, I know I'm forgetting Ken someone in there. Gerard. <laughs> Oh, that's right. And Ken Gerhardt. Sorry, Gerhardt. Ken. Mispronounced yeah, that. Sorry. We've uh, got Ken Gerhardt coming up for that. It's going to be a great, great event. So hopefully you can make it. As I was telling it. you earlier today, any one of those people would be worth yeah. it to come and visit and meet and listen to. So, but you've got five people. Well, man, Each one on their all, own would be, would it's be an, great. It's an all-star lineup, and yeah. you won't want to miss it. We've got a lot of stuff going on besides that, but it's going to be a great event. Yeah. So you can find information on that on our website at www.exnorthwest.com. I encourage you to purchase your tickets in advance um, because the event is limited on seating. So yeah. if you want to, you know, want to be there, you need to get your tickets as soon as you can. Right. And, right. uh, I think that's about it. That's about yeah. We have such you have such great guests lined up with to go over all this stuff. I think no one wants to hear us anymore. Nah, we're they done. They want to know what this is about. Okay, well we're going to take another short commercial break, and we'll be back with our guest. 
This show is sponsored by Extreme Expeditions Northwest LLC, your gateway to adventure, specializing in guided Bigfoot expeditions to Alaska and throughout the Pacific Northwest and Canada. Welcome back, my friends. And now it's time for our guest, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Freeman. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice to be here, guys. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to have you. And I'll tell you, I've got a lot of questions. A lot of questions for you, my friend. I might have an answer for you. <laughs> you know, and to be honest with you, I, I hate to admit I'm a little bit ignorant on this, but I really didn't know a lot about your father, uh, Paul Freeman. And I really didn't know a lot about all the work and everything that he had done. And just until recently with this uh, advent of you coming out with this book. And so I'm really excited to hear a few things about that. And if I may ask, what prompted you to do the book? Oh, gosh. Um, well, you know, it's something I had uh, kind of kicked around um, in like 2015, 2016. Um, and it was just it was kind of going through my head. But the book I had in mind at that time was a totally different book. It was going to be more about me um, and kind of what it was like growing up. And my dad was going to be the backdrop and Bigfoot was going to be the backdrop, that kind of thing. Um, and it just kind of faded away. And it's, um, you know, went on the back burner and I completely forgot about it, to be honest. Uh, and then, you know, I, I started talking to Cliff Berrickman one day and I was like, hey, you know, I, I have this idea and I kind of kicked it around and, you know, would you like to be a part of it? And, you know, first and foremost, uh, Cliff and I are really good friends and sometimes Friends in business don't, you know, they don't they don't mix that well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They never and, do, but right? Yeah, I'm an accountant. And so you know, CPA, Cliff so and I, I probably had it was at least an hour conversation, and and we talked about it, and we decided, okay, maybe we're not gonna go into business together on this book, yeah. But he said, I will help you in any way that I can. Um, and the next morning, Doug Highcheck called me on the phone because Cliff had talked to him. Yeah. And uh, Doug Hycheck was, was someone that had knew my dad, and he'd worked with him before, and uh, he was fond of my dad, and, and they'd worked together on, on some of the, the Freeman footage. Um, and Doug said, hey, let's do it. And I said, yeah, let's do it. And um, what ended up happening was we, we had a meeting, and we had a, a discussion, and we decided instead of telling a story about me or, or even really just a story about my dad, that what we were going to do is we were going to take – all the evidence, and that's what we were going to show to people, yeah. and we weren't going to keep that a secret. But, I mean, to, I guess, more thoroughly answer your question, um, I just, I, I felt like I needed to because my father was going to write a book. Okay. And yeah. he had these audio tapes, uh, seven, about seven hours worth of audio oh, that he recorded God. in private wow. on cassette tapes, and nobody ever knew yep. about it. Yep. And... He died before he had a chance to write the book. Oh, wow. And I have these tapes. And, and actually, aside from a few people who have heard some clips, I'm the only one that's ever even heard them. Wow. Yeah. And so I, you know, I decided that uh, I was just going to write the book for him. So these, I mean, like basically he's dictating what his research and all of that, that's what he's it's, doing? Uh, yeah, tapes? it's the story of uh, his Bigfoot research um, and how it started and kind of, you know, how it ended. And uh, there's personal stuff on there. As well, and I, I would like to, you know, share all of it with everybody, you know. But unfortunately, you know, seven, eight hours worth of audio yeah. uh, has to be condensed, you know, a little bit. But there's yeah. some really good stories in there. And um, but yeah, I just decided, you know, he didn't get a chance to write a book before he died, and it's kind of one last thing that I can do for my dad mm -hmm. and put his story out there, write the book for him, and uh, hopefully push his legacy out there. And along the way dispel some rumors and some yeah. myths that are out there about him. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Wonderful. And since you brought it up, that was one of the questions that I had okay. for you. And what these, I hear the rumors in myths and whatnot. What exactly is that all about? What was the, the you know, there's some controversy. Some people said some things that weren't too cool. They claimed hoaxing or whatever. Yeah, ba basically. Yeah. So in the early 80s, in, you know, 1982, when he had his first encounter, um, there, were, there were some things that happened. Um, and it, it kind of all started, to be honest, with uh, a man by the name of Joel Harden, um, who was a professional tracker for the United States Border Patrol. 
And when my dad had his first encounter working for the Forest Service in the Mill Creek watershed, and then six days later they found more tracks with a fellow employee by the name of Bill Epic, uh, the three major news networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, all wanted access to the watershed, which is restricted land. Unless you're a government employee, you can't go in there except for like a week out of the year, which is a special elk hunting season. Um, the Forest Service didn't want to allow them access, and so they filed an injunction uh, with the court against the Forest Service, and the judge gave the Forest Service 48 hours to prove that the tracks were fake by way of a hoax. Otherwise, they were going to allow the media into the watershed. Uh -huh. And so the government brought in another government employee, a man by the name of Joel Harden, uh, to say that these, these tracks were fake. And that's, that's the reason that he was brought in. Um, there's also a rumor, I should say, uh, that he had spoken with Renee DeHendon uh, before he even saw the tracks, and they had decided together that these tracks were not real. Um, and as Grover Krantz will tell you, it's in his book, Big Footprints, um, he had a conversation with three Forest Service employees that heard Mr. Harden say that these tracks were fake before he ever even looked at them. So somebody had an extra grind already. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's when, when you take a look at it, the, the Forest Service of the government there, they, they had a reason to prove these fake. Uh, yeah. They brought somebody in that was that was going to do that, and that was his job. And, and nothing against Mr. Harden. I'm sure he's a fantastic tracker of men, because that's what he was. He was a man tracker, yeah. uh, but he had no experience tracking Bigfoot. Uh, he's not a believer in Bigfoot, actually. Um, he has no experience tracking great apes whatsoever. Uh, and one of the comments that he did make was that these tracks couldn't be from an animal. They couldn't be real because animals don't have dermal ridges on the pads of their feet, uh, but great apes do. And uh, he failed to, to realize that, um, but he was not familiar with the gait. He was not familiar with uh, different you know, foot anatomy and the way that the, the yeah, foot sure. would flex or form. He wasn't familiar with an animal that was this weight or that agile or the things it could do. And you know, to be honest, I think he was a little in over his head. Sure. But uh, you know, he said, yeah, I don't think these are real. Um, and oh, okay. they kind of yeah. ran from there, and the Forest Service didn't have to let the media come in. Yeah. But and, you answered that you know, the most important question. Why would someone want, you know, want to dispute what your dad had found? Well, you answered that. The Forest Service wanted a yeah. result, well, and they no, found they were, somebody yeah. who would give them Absolutely. the answer they, they did they not want to allow the national media into government land yeah. to have a flood of people go in there. Um, and they didn't want to have, you know, excitement and civilians trying to get in there and trespass uh, over, you know, over the situation. And that situation was handled, you know. And, um, you know, Joel Harden wrote a book called Tracker, and he actually talks about the situation in the book. And um, he admits himself that he was brought in to say that these were fake. Um, and he talks about the injunction. And there's a few other things he says in there that I, I don't necessarily agree with. But, you know, everyone has something to sell. Um, and he did as well, you know, and then on top of that, you know, Renee DeHendon uh, was kind of one of those early causes of people looking at my dad and, you know, kind of putting that label on him as well. And Renee was a great researcher, you know, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from Renee, but one of the problems we had at that time is that those old school trackers and Bigfoot hunters didn't have the information that we have today about the foot and the yeah. biomechanics and the anatomy of the Bigfoot. Um, and so, you know, things like dorsiflexion, where the toes flex upward, and when they make a track, it doesn't always show the whole toe, and sometimes it appears to be really short. And there's clips of Renata Hendon looking at my father's cast and saying, oh, look at these little short toes. You can't tell me <laughs> that this is real. No. Well, he didn't know. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and so they just initially thought, like, oh, you know, these are fake. Yeah. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Renee and my dad spent a lot of time together, actually, 1982 and 1983. Renee would come to our house. He would sleep on our pull-out sofa bed. I remember him being there vividly, um, and they would go ride trail bikes in the mountains and, and challenge each other to do crazy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stupid things on these bikes and whatnot. Um, and, you know, they just kind of had a, a disagreement. But you have to keep in mind, you know, at that time, Renee was kind of the face of, of the Bigfoot world. Yeah. And here comes my dad, and he's the first person that finds these verifiable dermals, and he gets national attention, 
and he gets a national ice cream commercial with Dryer's yeah, Ice Cream. Yeah, I was reading about that. Do you have a copy you know, of the commercial? I'd love to see it. Uh, I do have a copy of the commercial. Oh my gosh, um, and there's it. another one of those rumors out there, and I don't know if it's true or not, and I, my dad's not alive to ask him, but, you know, it's. I've been told that Renee DeHendon was the other person that was up for that, and he didn't get it. Oh. Um, and, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you look back on it, and again, nothing against Renee, but, um, no. you know, when you, when you look back at some of these situations, just kind of not knowing what we know now, and then maybe yeah. there's a case of, like, oh. my fame or whatever is getting cut into by this other person. Jealousy. That's plain and simple. You said it. I didn't say there's it. There's no jealousy <laughs> in the Bigfoot community. <laughs> you, you know, there's jealousy um, everywhere. You know, but, uh, for, for, it's, for whatever reason, for whatever reason yeah. yeah. some of these people kind of had what yeah. they felt like, I guess, was a reason to, to kind of try to, to take yeah. his name a little bit. Because I mean, I, I read on, I, you know, I did as much research as I could that's available online anyways, before this interview and stuff. And it seems like I mean, people were really yeah. quick to jump to some conclusions well, about they, that. They thing. always are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was on a everything. little quick. You know, it's like, yeah. oh no, you know, all of a sudden this guy found this stuff. But for my own uh, knowledge, to put this in perspective, so your dad had his first sighting in 1982. June 10th, 1982. June 10th, 1982. Now, is that when he found these tracks that they were disputing? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, the tracks they were disputing are, are what we know now as the, the Paul Freeman dermals, which are in the Smithsonian Institution now. Okay. Um, and uh, something Grover Krantz totally went all in on and supported, you know, till the end of his life. He's actually the one who took him to the Smithsonian. And we all know that Dr. Krantz was the smartest guy, yeah. you know, that was on that scene. Um, so those were found six days later, and those were found June 16th, oh, 1982. Okay. All right. um, and my, my dad was with Bill Epic, another Forest Service employee. They were actually eating lunch, um, and they came across what we know as the dermals. And it was actually it was about 40 footprints, um, and wow. the, you know what we know as the knuckle print um, what was found with them as well. Um, and then those were the ones that really kind of garnered the national media, but um, it was close to the, the sighting six days earlier, and so the, it was, yeah. the events were kind of smashed together, so it was kind of all one big event that the yeah. news media wanted to cover, and it, and it kind of caused, you know, this, this firestorm and this whirlwind, and, uh, and then it got shut up real fast. Yeah. Wow. Man, it just seems like it really exploded, you know, quickly with people all over it. So it must, it must have been a real serious event. To get as much attention. Uh, it was a serious enough, serious enough event for the courts to be involved yeah. and for the news media to file an injunction and for the Forest Service to bring in another government employee yeah. um, and for them also to demote my father to a desk job where he was not allowed to go out um, and patrol <laughs> on foot or on horseback anymore. I mean, that's terrible. Because they did not want him no. uh, looking for Bigfoot. He was drug tested. He was accused of uh, wow. being drunk on the job. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a terrible. lot of things that's, that went on. That's terrible. Um, and, but it's, it's not the first time, and it's not uncommon. And, yeah. uh, a, you know, a gentleman by the name of John Meinsinski in 1972 in the Shoshone National Forest in Wyoming, who was working for the, the Forest Service, and, and he's a biologist, uh, he had an encounter. And it was very similar where they told him, you're not going to talk about this anymore, or you're not going to work for the government anymore. Wow. Like, you, you need know, to shut up. That's interesting because I, around here and recently, there, you know, a lot of people who worked for, you know, the Forest Service, you know, they all, they won't outwardly talk about it, or they say they don't exist, but they, through back channels, they will tell you, right. uh, yeah. You know, this is happening in this area. We have seen this and stuff like that. And I think that's that's a shame that they can't speak openly about it. But anyway, so well, I mean, so there's a lot of that. In there's reason. there's reasons to keep the general population in the dark yeah. um, on a lot of things. You know, not just Bigfoot, uh, but there's always a reason to do that. You, yeah. you don't want. Uh, you know, 500 armed people running around trying okay. to kill Bigfoot, <laughs> trespassing in the watershed, no. well, you know. <laughs> you know, speaking of that, we've got to follow up on whatever happened. This is off subject, but I'll remember. It's the, the where is it, Louisiana Bigfoot bounty? Oklahoma Bigfoot bounty. Yeah. Evidently, nobody got that bounty, I but we need so. to follow up on that. Oh, oh, of course they did, yeah. Yeah, because they yeah. probably did have, a th yeah, a thousand people running around with guns and everything. Well, and that's she, the know. thing, though, is 
government employees are inherently lazy and they just want to come and get their paycheck. And if anything new comes along, that might create more work. <laughs> and they don't want to hey. do it. I work with the IRS a lot. And let me so, tell you, I know government employees. Oh, and that, wow. and I know you don't want to say it because of all the backlash, but eh, I don't yeah, care. I, I have I no mean, comment that's, on nah, that. But yeah, that's, no, I have no, but that's I have really no comment is, on that, Mitch. Is the fear of the unknown. Oh, geez, can you imagine? Around here, uh, uh, wow. funeral home told me, you know, when you get cremated, you know, they want to go to Mount Spokane. And she was a director, and she said, if you want to do that, just go do it. It's just ashes. <laughs> but don't ask permission, because the people at the Park Service will go, oh, my goodness, now I've got all this paperwork to do. Right. So for anyone watching who wants to have their ashes spread on Mount Spokane, <laughs> just do it. I got off subject. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. All right, right on. on subject. <laughs> no, it shows the government employees the show are that's lazy. all about Bigfoot. Don't uh, dump your ashes on Mount Spokane, or Joel Harden will come and track are, you down. Well, because <laughs> we're, we're skirting around the question. Question: What was the? Why did the government okay. want to go to such extremes to I, prevent your dad? I, I I'll recommend a few podcasts to listen to, and they'll tell you why. There you go. Right. But anyways, to get back, thank you. Well, for I already that. know why. Continuing. Thank you. I love you, Mitch. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> um, so I want to get some timeline here. 1982, first sighting, and then they found the tracks that were all the the big hubbub was about on the 16th. Correct. It was later. Yep. Okay. And then it, it, we've. Fast forward a bit, if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, the Freeman footage. When exactly did he capture that? We're going to show a clip of that here in just a minute. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that was August 20th, 1992. So just over 10 years August later. 20th of 1992. Correct. Okay. All right. There is some misinformation on the internet. Uh, there certainly is. There's a couple versions on the internet that have a 1994 yeah. copyright stamp on them. Um, that is incorrect. It, it was 1992. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And for those of you that may not be familiar with what the Freeman footage is, it's what it's about 11 minutes or 13 minutes long uh, video that his father caught of a Bigfoot. And it's very, it, it's 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 very similar, I, I would say, to what the Patterson Gimlin film. Uh, Somewhat. There are similarities, yeah, and there's, there's also differences. Yeah. yeah, and uh, so we're going to play a clip of that uh, in a minute. But if you could, please tell us about what led up to that, you know, where he was at. And uh, well, I mean, honestly, what led up to that was uh, 10 years of mapping data on a Forest Service map that we had that hung in our garage. Uh, that my dad and, and David Bean and Bill Lowry and, and Grover Krantz and Wes Summerlin and those guys, every time they found tracks, every time there was a reported sighting, every time they found hair, broken trees, possible nests, anything like that, yeah. it was put on this map that hung in our garage. Uh, this map actually is at the North American Bigfoot Center in Boring, Oregon, and uh, Cliff Bergman is the curator of it now. So if you've never seen it and you get a chance to go down there, it's big, it's beautiful, it's hanging on the wall, you can read it, you can stand real close to it, it's right there. Um, but so for 10 years, all this information went on this map. And one of the things that we learn is that this one particular area called Deduck Spring is just this okay, yeah. hotbed. And it's, it's just year after year, and especially in mid to late August, we start getting a lot of evidence that, that comes out of there. And so, you know, by the 10 year mark, my dad had really dialed down on this area. And he knew they were going to be coming there because it's a viable water source. It never dries up, and it's cold water. And the Blue Mountains, you know, they're arid, it's, it's high desert. You know, and um, you do get water there, but you don't get a lot of real good fresh water that runs all through the summer, especially when we have really hot summers. And, and so a, a lot of game use that area. But my dad knew they were going to be there. He had concentrated his efforts on being there. Uh, the week that the footage was shot, he was there every single day of the week. And the couple weeks leading up to that, he'd been there five so times. He really concentrated you know, on that spot. Um, days out of the week. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Uh, for sure. And he, he was going there very early in the morning when it was dark. And he was sitting and he was watching the pond. Um, and he was waiting for them to show themselves. And they just weren't there. And uh, he just had in his brain, you know, as a tracker, that they were coming earlier than he was. And they were coming under the cover of darkness. And they were getting water. And they were leaving before he got there and that they had figured out, you know, kind of his routine or his, yeah, his yeah. scent, at least, or, or whatnot. Um, and so he started to come earlier. 
on the weekends when he didn't have to work, you know, and he was working a night job at the time. And so he was getting off work about four o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and then he'd make his drive out there. It's about an hour and a half. So he'd get there five thirty, six o'clock in the morning. And so on the weekends, he started going even earlier, getting up and trying to get there by like four o'clock in the morning. Um, and he, he still <laughs> wasn't finding out. anything, you know, yeah. there was no luck. Um, but by chance, whatever you want to call it, uh, the night before he actually got the footage, he received a phone call from my older sister, Linda. And uh, I just want to say uh, my older sister passed away this June oh. in a motorcycle accident, so may she rest in peace. Um, and we will all miss her, but she has an integral part in the story and my father actually getting this footage. So he gets a phone call from my sister, and she says, Dad, my car won't start. Could you come fix it for me? And he said, well, you know, sis, he, we always called her sis. I got to go to work. I'll come over in the morning. I won't go to the mountains tomorrow. So he gets up, you know, he goes to work. He comes home. He sleeps for a little bit. He gets up. He goes and he gets his coffee. And then he goes to my sister's house. And he fixes her car and he gets it started so she can go to work. And then he starts driving home. And this is around 9 a.m. in the morning. So far after he would normally yeah. even arrive. And part of the way home, for whatever reason, he just had this thought and he said, well, you know, hey, what the hell? And I'll just go up there and maybe there's footprints or, you know, something we can find. Um, and so he got up there, you know, there's a, a little dispute. Uh, some people think he got there about nine. That really doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and the original master copy of the tape has 11 a.m. written on it. And so I think he left about nine. He got there around 1030, 1040 yeah. in the morning. Um, and he walked right up on one. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he wasn't oh. there that morning when he normally was. Mm -hmm. And they came out. And uh, I can only think, I mean, honestly, is that they were watching him and waiting for him to leave. Mm -hmm. And then they were coming and they were getting their water. And when he wasn't there that day, they yeah. decided to show themselves and, you know, thank God or whatever you want to say uh, for a chance of my, my sister's crummy car. Uh, we got this footage. If she'd had a better vehicle, you know, this may not exist. Okay, well, what I'd like to do right now is I want to play a clip of it. And he's, uh, Michael's kind enough to let us play uh, just a short clip of that film. And we're going to do that right now. Let's check this out. This is incredible. Back up the road, come down the road. Yeah, look at there. Sure has. Let me stay. Get there, where he's coming back up, going back up. Yeah. See much up through here. I hear the brush popping and stuff. Oh, there he goes. Jesus. Get up here where I can see him real quick. Wow. What do you think of that? That was some incredible, incredible footage. What, what, do you, what do you think of that? It is. That's it the is. first time you've seen it. I've watched it like two oh. dozen times. Oh, right. Well, and a lot of times, let's face it, it's kind of hard to discern because people go like, oh, well, the whole stump thing up in, you know, that they talk about now and stuff. And how do you know, you know, if you're just looking on your computer, but when you have, um, gentleman here today explaining all the yeah. background about it then it's like wow uh, it's just fascinating you know i've watched a lot of footage but i'm really really intrigued with this one and i have to tell you not just 
because of what you see, because you've seen some stuff that's similar to it, but the way that your father reacts. The audio. The audio, right. the way that he reacts makes it seem that much more legitimate to me and yeah. real because, you know, he doesn't go, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, people will do that on these right. videos and stuff like that. But yeah. he's, you, you can, you can tell that he's a very confident well, there man. There he is, he's, yep. been a lot, he's very experienced out in the woods and he's been on this for a while and he sees him and he reacts the way yeah. that I would expect him to. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to keep in mind it wasn't his first sighting. Yeah, it's and not that's his, it's not his first yeah. encounter. Yeah, it's, it's very and real. you can tell that he's still excited, you know, yeah. and, and we have that Jesus, yeah. you, you know, moment where yeah. his voice gets a, a little bit shaky in there. Um, but yeah, one of the nice things about my dad's footage is the audio. Yeah. Because we have that there. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's something that we don't have with the Patterson Gimlin. Yeah. Film. Right. And so we don't know what was being said. And that's, yeah. you know, don't get me wrong, it's a fantastic piece sure. of visual evidence. But I wish yeah. we had the audio to go with that yeah. as well. So you it know, is exactly. one of the things that makes my dad's footage really special. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, here we are. And this was uh, August of 1992. What kind of camera did he have? Um, it was a, a Sony 8-millimeter uh, oh. magnetic digital tape. Okay. okay. Uh, so crummy, crummy technology. Yeah. It was convenient. You could plug the tape in. You could plug it into your TV and watch it. Yeah. I wish it would have been like 16 millimeter film. Yeah. Uh, that would have been so much easier to be able to see and enhance. Um, but it was, you know, newer technology for the time. But unfortunately, it's only like 400 yeah. pixels, and mm -hmm. it's it's really hard to well, even zoom in on it. By today's standards, it was crummy. But it's then crummy. again, compared to 1967 with the Patterson Gimlin. Yeah. It was, wow, state yeah, of the art. Yeah. State of the art, and so, I wish that's what we had. And yeah. if you talk to people that enhance you know, footage and you talk to, like, say, Doug Hycheck or even yeah. Cliff Berkman, who no. are both working on this, they'll tell you this format is just, it's a shame that's what it was shot on. Yeah. For the folks out there, could you, Doug Hycheck, I'm not sure, I would like a lot of people to know who he is, and I don't know if they do or not. Because okay. I didn't know who he was until, like, you told me. Oh, well, oh three yeah, weeks yeah. Ago, On a you know? previous show, he was the one that we mentioned about the electric vehicle or the electric bicycle and how to then use that to go through the woods. That's a guy who made the electric bicycle yep. that you were trying that to sell on the pedal on the show last, yeah, last time? I get it. That was funny. Yeah, I was pedaling an electric bike. Is, is that true? No, that's the same guy. Uh, I don't know if that's true, actually, and it wouldn't it surprise is. me. He's very smart. Yeah, okay. no, very, smart very smart. And yeah, no, that's the guy. No, and but it's fascinating. Um, no, yeah. Doug Hycheck is the creator and producer of Monster Quest. Yep. Um, he um, also did the DVD release of Sasquatch Legend Meets Science. Okay. Um, he owns White Wolf Entertainment. Uh, he also owns Hangar One Publishing. Hangar One, that's right. Which is the, the publisher, you know, he's yeah. the one publishing my book. Um, and he is, a, you know, um, a lifelong uh, professional wildlife photographer. Okay. And a very, very intelligent individual. Very, yeah. yeah. Well, I will tell you, I saw that after the first time that we spoke, I got on YouTube and I looked for the Freeman footage. and. That it was absolutely horrible. It's terrible. Absolutely horrible yeah. quality. It was, I mean, it was really bad. And m hats off to uh, Doug Hycheck. He did the enhancement on this. This is uh, he did. Yes, man, this is like one thousand times better uh, than Doug and his son Blaine yeah. uh, did the enhancement on this. Yeah, and the the one you see on you if you go YouTube or whatever, and, yeah. and you watch the ones that are online, it's the original footage that was then transferred to VHS. Yeah, um, and yeah. it's all interlaced. Um, and then it was transferred to, you know, DVD yeah, man, or, or it, whatever it, they're showing. It was, it's rough. And it's rough, and it looks, it looks terrible. Um, and the, the actual original master footage, which, you know, is something that's kept in my possession, looks better than all of that. Um, and these enhancements that, that have yeah. been done off that um, are the best we've been able to see so far. Now, yeah, man, it's so much better. Now, after we got this, was there a media storm? Yes. That out in this area and all of that kind of stuff like before? Uh, yeah, there was a media storm. And much like 10 years prior, we found ourselves, you know, or I, he found himself um, in the national spotlight again. Um, and on, you know, hard copy and, and some of these shows oh, that no were, <laughs> were wanting to, you know, get him on there and, yeah. and interview him and, and do some of this stuff. But, you know, um, you know, as you know, I always say, it, it's short lived because yeah. it's Bigfoot. And the first thing that happens is the skeptics and the detractors come in yeah. 
and they say it's fake and this and this and this and then it's Paul Freeman of course which we already have kind of uh, a history of a black cloud a little bit you know that follows him around from things that have been said in the past and so his initial excitement over I finally got this look at this I'm Mm -hmm. not crazy you know it it died real fast because that's what happens with Bigfoot you know yeah Yeah. well and once again I want to tell you folks there is a lot more to this film like was it nine minutes or something like that you're going to see some absolute incredible stuff and please tell them my friend why can't they see it all now uh you can't see it all now because um I am releasing uh part of this video that uh, most people don't even know exists uh there's an anomaly in this film that Doug Highcheck actually uh, discovered in 2000 um, in the original footage, um, and it was not presented to my father until 2001. So my dad didn't even know about this until almost 10 years after the video was made. Um, and there's a rumor, so some people know that this may exist, uh, but there's actually uh, a baby that's in this footage. Um, and you oh, can see the uh, mother, or what we would call the adult Sasquatch, pick it up and like put it on her hip. And at this point, I think with the enhancements, and I think you've seen this, it's, it's pretty undeniable at this point. Um, and yeah. it's something that before this, it wasn't good enough to release. We weren't comfortable releasing it. But I think now, after the enhancements we have, we're, we're comfortable letting this be released. And uh, this will be in my book. And it's going to be footage that comes yeah. with the book that's going to be released for the first time for everyone to see. And so, um, you know, sorry. Uh, it is marketing. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we yeah. got to do what we got to do, yeah. but uh, I'm not letting the footage be released at this point in time. But um, within the next, I, I think, three weeks, everyone's yeah. going to have okay. the, the chance to yeah. see it because we're getting and, real close to the book. And it's the Freeman Bigfoot Files. And we're going to we're going to post a copy of the book cover. It's really cool um, by Michael Paul Freeman with Paul Freeman. And there's four words and things and excerpts in there with Dr. Meldrum, Cliff Berrickman and Dar Gas, okay, you. Uh, Dar Glasgow Addington. I can't. Uh, and she um, is a female researcher that worked closely with my dad in the field. Um, she's actually the last surviving member of that group of researchers in the Blue Mountains. Uh, she has all the stories now, um, and uh, she took fantastic field notes. And so that's going to be part of the book. Are these detailed field notes of, of looking yeah. at, at tracks with my dad? And it's the first thing she's ever done publicly with Bigfoot. Yeah. Um, and she is a, a fantastic woman and individual, and, and uh, I, I'm trying to get her name to be more popular because she deserves some recognition. Sure. Yeah. How, does, how does a person get this book? Is it Amazon like everybody else? Well, or? right now it's on pre-order, okay. and it's only available through Hangar One Publishing, Okay. Uh, and that's one. HangarOnePublishing.com. Okay. Um, it's a 20% discount right now if you order it uh, on the pre-order, but when it is done in the next couple weeks, um, it will be available on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com and, and all those places you would okay. ex, you would expect to see a book. Yeah. So cool! Yeah. Wow! And Mitch, I already ordered two: one for you and one for me. You're the person. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. <laughs> Man, I'm not wasting around. I, mean, I got those yeah. suckers. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm well, you know what? Yeah. Bring them to the Sasquatch, you know, yeah. uh, festival, the Roundup uh, next June, because you know Cliff and Jeff both contributed to the book. You can, it's a good. A, you can yeah. have them sign it. You can get a yep. bunch of autographs on there. Yeah. Absolutely. Three of the people that helped yeah. contribute to it, yeah. at least, and I believe there's a possibility that Dar Addington may come up yeah. to see me yeah. and Cliff uh, during this event, so she might be there. That'd so. be yeah. sweet. That'd yeah. be awesome. Awesome. Okay. Now, you've got a lot of nice tracks here. Castings. I have a few nice casts. And, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we're getting short on time, and I'd like you to tell us, uh, show the folks and go down the line there and tell us which uh, what's significant about these casts and when well you, you know we'll start with uh with this one right here and i can i can hold this up so everybody can see it um and we talked about these earlier uh yeah. this is one of the tracks that mr jo- uh, mr joel harden came to see this is uh the left foot dermal from june 16th 1982 and uh, the original of this uh dr grover Krantz took to the smithsonian institution and it, it remains there to this day. And I know you had a chance to look at it uh, earlier. Or maybe it was you. Yep. Uh, or yep. both of you. And I we think were, we're both there. taking a look at the dermals on there because they're plain as day. I mean, you can see them. But this is a very famous cast in uh, Bigfoot history. And for the not-so-bright people like myself, that's the left foot. 
because if you turned it over, <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. So it's, 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 not, it's, it's kind of a mirror image of well, its no, actual self. Well, no, I can self, see people right? hung going, "Well, I didn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the left foot." Right. Uh, just, and just making yeah. it clear. We'll just kind of go down the line by date a little bit. Sure. Yeah. No, um, that's the one. Man, look yeah. at that monster. So wow. this is a cast that we call Rockfoot. And this was actually cast on September 29th, 1988. Um, it's 18 inches long. It's 9 inches wide. Yeah. And the reason we call this Rockfoot and what makes this really impressive is this rock here that it stepped on and pressed not only down, but forward into the ground with its weight. And you can actually see where the pad of the foot formed around the rock. Um, and we believe that Sasquatch have this very thick, durable pad on the bottoms of their feet uh, for this particular reason. Because if you're a bipedal animal <laughs> that is barefoot, um, you cannot afford to have an injury to either one of your feet. That is yeah. almost certain death. Yeah. Uh, in that situation, and, and so they form these these thick pads. But this yeah. is a fantastic cast. It's a six pound cast. Yeah. It's gigantic. Everybody loves this. It's ginormous. It's ginormous. <laughs> now I'll tell you a secret, though. You want to know a secret? Yes. Everybody seems to think that this is a giant alpha male. Um, I don't think so. And uh, me and a few other prominent individuals who know a little bit about tracks and casts, yeah. uh, one being Dr. Jeff Meldrum and the other Cliff Berrickman actually believe that this is about a 14 inch foot and when it stepped on the rock we had a little bit of sliding and an over exaggeration of toe splay maybe a ow you know what was yeah, that sure. kind of moment and that this foot is probably not actually as big as the yeah. cast is but it sure does look cool and this is yeah. my favorite big foot cast yeah. of all time look at the toe how the toes go splay out like that it's yeah um we actually think and i didn't bring another one of uh the examples of the individual, but we actually think that this cast might be an individual that we know as Wrinklefoot, uh, that uh, you can read about in Dr. Krantz's oh, uh, book, Foot. Big Footprints. You can also read about Wrinklefoot um, in Jeff Meldrum's book, Sasquatch, A Legend Meets Science, and he refers to it in that book as the, the Table Springs casts, because uh, okay. of where they were found. Um, but Wrinklefoot is about a 14 inch footprint, um, and we believe that that's a female. Interesting. Uh, so and then, yeah. the next one I'll go to is this one, because this is always a popular one as well. And this was actually, I'm going to go out of order of, of date, because I'm saving the other one for last. Um, this was cast in 1994 uh, at a place called Biscuit Ridge. And I talked about a Mr. John Mainzinski earlier from Wyoming. And he was there with my father, and he uh, has a footprint from this animal that he got to take home. But this is a really nice handprint. A lot of people like to say this is like the Han Solo hand because it kind of looks like yeah, Han's yeah, hand yeah, coming, yeah, coming out of the carbonite. But uh, I don't know how well we can, we can see, but uh, I mean, I'm six foot three, and yeah. uh, you know, I have a very small hand compared to this one, and this is not even you know, one of the bigger handprints that, that we actually have, but a really, really fine example. You have, excuse me, you have more handprints at home? Uh, yes, we have more handprints. Um, the one I'm referring to, the bigger one, I do not have at home, um, and it was cast at 1980, in 1986, and it is, I wouldn't say twice this size, but close to it. Wow. wow. Um, the last cast I brought is actually this little one. That's a dinker, man. Um, 13, <laughs> 13 and a half inches is, is all this is. Now, uh, this particular animal, and I'll point it out to you guys because we haven't talked about this, um, and then you can rewatch the video if you want. Uh, but to uh, give away no secrets, this is the cast that was taken from the, the mm -hmm. pond bed uh, after the footage was shot. This was taken the day after the footage. So this is the animal from the Freeman footage. Uh, I re affectionately refer to her as Big Jill because Big we Jill. do believe this is a female. Uh, and we have tracks of Big Jill um, in 1991. Uh, Mill Creek Road, we have tracks of Big Jill in 1992 at D-Duck Spring. Um, Dr. Jeff Meldrum has a famous trackway in 1996 that he cast at five points outside of Walla Walla that my father took him to the first time they met. It is the same animal. That is also Big Jill. Um, I have also uh, no casts from the event, but pictures of tracks from 1995 that I believe to be the same animal, which is Big Jill. Yeah. Um, and what's funny about Big Jill, if you could let me talk for a minute here, sorry guys. Um, when sh my father first saw her for the first time, which was a year prior to the footage, at a, the Mill Creek Road tracks, which are 
absolutely amazing. And if you don't know anything about those, you should, you should study that. But uh, wilderness survival instructor Greg May from Washington State University tracked those for what he estimated to be between six to eight miles wow. of unbroken tracks without wow. human sign, if you can imagine wow. that. And he estimated 5,000 sets of footprints, which Man. is about 10,000 steps. Jeez. Um, it's the longest trackway I've ever heard of. I think it's the longest trackway that's ever been recorded, actually. Um, and when my father and Wes Summerlin and a man by the name of Vance Orchard, who was a journalist and an outdoorsman from Walla Walla, first arrived on the scene, Wes Summerlin immediately recognized the tracks in the ground as an animal that he was familiar with and that wow. he had seen prints of before. Um, and there had been possible sightings of this animal before going back some years. And he had affectionately named this animal Big Jim. Um, and it's not a mistake. I mean, they, yeah. if you listen to my dad, even in the video, there he goes. Everything was referred to as a he. Uh, we now know, or we think we know at least, due to the fact that we have about a six or seven year period at least of verifiable tracks and you know casts um, of this animal and they never get any bigger. It's a fully mature animal mm. for yeah. this period. So we, we can assume it's fully grown. And at 13, 13 and a half inches, this is a female. Um, and so instead of Big Jim, I have named her <laughs> Big Jill. Jill. Um, but you know, we, ju we just showed the video and uh, it is Big Jill that's, that's in this video. And one thing I do wanna point out about Big Jill that most people don't recognize right off the bat is that Big Jill, and this is her left foot, and it's more prominent on her left foot, um, and you're looking at it, you'll see in a minute, has a, a unique uh, genetic condition, and it's called Morton's foot. And Morton's foot is when not only your second toe, but also your third toe are longer mm -hmm. than your big toe. Wow. Yeah. And so when we see casts of Big Jill, um, it's not always prevalent because it depends on the substrate. And if it's like really wet or really muddy, sometimes you know they come out differently. Um, but if you watch the video again, um, when she leaves a track on a hard, flat surface, and I should have brought that cast, I didn't bring it. Um, her second toe is about this long, actually. Really? Wow. It's like at least a half inch, three quarters of an inch longer than her big toe. And there's a real good still, if you watch the Freeman footage, when he's going up the trail of the prints yeah. that were left in the trail in the dust, one of them is dead on. The second toe is what looks to be about a half inch, three quarters of an inch longer than, than the big toe. And that's how we initially knew that the, the animal in the footage was the same one, is that was seen and it was immediate. We know who this is. Um, and then we started comparing the rest of the, the tracks that you can see in the video. And this is the only cast that has survived from the footage. We know there, oh, really? was, we know there was more made. Yeah. We don't know where they are. Hmm. So they're in someone's home someplace. <laughs> Um, and uh, my father was notorious for giving things away and he gave casts away yeah. um, when he met people and, and things like that. And so this is the only surviving cast, uh, but Big Jill is easily identifiable, not only by that, um, but, but also by the, the shape of her foot. And if I would have brought more casts of hers, I think I have four of them sitting on my, my shelf in my garage. Um, maybe I should have done that, but you could look at them and you, you can see the same features yeah. in all of them. Now, you're gonna bring all these to the uh, Sasquatch Roundup, right? Oh, sure, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you guys will get a I can bring a whole table full of, of uh, cast to the absolutely. Sasquatch Roundup for people to look at. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Wonderful. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, she has a really distinctive foot um, and 13 and a half inches, um, and we know that she's mature. And uh, we also know uh, from, you know, uh, video enhancements that she's a mother. Yeah. Uh, or, or at least yeah, we think guys, she's a mother. You, Maybe she's an aunt yeah. or an older sister. Yeah. We're not quite sure. Or a nanny. The no. one nanny? thing that uh, you do hear brought up, and Doug Hycheck likes to bring this up a lot, and he will, he will tell you, is if you watch the video again, um, especially if you get into close-ups and slow motion, she certainly does seem to look like she has a very large abdomen. Yes. Um, like that she may be pregnant yeah, she, yeah. or very recently postpartum. Um, and I don't know how long their gestation period is or, you know, what their mating is or anything like that. It's kind of guesswork. But, I mean, we would assume it's somewhat close to humans. 
Um, and if that is a, a juvenile um, in the video that she's picking up is a year old, let's say, it's very possible that she's pregnant again. Um, but she looks absolutely massive. She does. And, you know, I don't think she's that tall, Yeah. to be honest. I, I don't think she's the typical seven to eight foot tall Bigfoot. Yeah. Um, I actually believe she's about six foot six, maybe slightly taller. Um, but my estimate right now is between 550 and 600 pounds. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Man. That's some amazing stuff, man. Jeez Louise. What, uh, see what else, what else I was gonna ask you? Oh, yeah, no, what about you? I had to ask you, did, when, you when you were younger, did you, did you ever go out with your dad? I did. did he yeah. did take you out. He did take me out. Um, now, I wasn't allowed to go out until I was 10. Okay. And, and I have an older brother who's uh, about, just about 12 years older than me, 11 and a half years older than me. And he went out with my dad and, and he was 16 about um, when my dad had his first encounter in 82, and I was five years old. And, you know, I'm not sure why the reason I didn't get to go out until I was 10. Maybe he didn't think it was safe to take a five-year-old Bigfoot hunting. Yeah. Or maybe he's afraid I was going to stomp around in the tracks, you know, or, or whatever. But <laughs> yeah. I think it was the right decision. And, and I, you know, if you're out casting tracks yeah. and actively hunting, which he was at the time, uh, you know, Sasquatch, I don't think your five-year-old needs to be in tow with you. But uh, when I was 10, I got to go look at my first tracks. Uh, when I was 14, I got to uh, pour plaster and cast a track, and that was actually at the Mill Creek Road tracks in 1991 nice. that we were talking about, the, you know, the one that was close to eight miles long. Um, I actually made a cast of that, and we don't have that. It probably was terrible and got thrown away as soon as we got home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, so that, <laughs> no. cast, that cast is not around, uh, but yeah. I got to do that. But no, um, I was actually between the ages of... 10 to 14, 15, I spent a good deal of time with my dad uh, in the mountains and, you know, looking at Bigfoot tracks. And yeah. um, I've never seen one, personally. I've never had a sighting, uh, but I've been close to one. Yeah. And uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, you walk up on fresh tracks and the forest, you know, just goes silent like a clock that stopped. And it's, it's, there's nothing quite as eerie as that. And sometimes I get goosebumps, like, you know, um, yeah. even, even talking about kind of, kind of that feeling. Um, but, uh, and I have a, a fun little story um, in, that I tell in the book about, you know, one time that we think one was possibly following, following us when I was, uh, I think, 12 years old. Huh? But, um, yeah, so uh, I, I did do some of that. And I have done some uh, research, you know, as an older uh, adult, um, and if anything happens locally, you know, uh, I try to pay attention to it, and I've, I've gone out, but uh, I'm not what you would call an active boots on the ground researcher at this point in time. I, I don't have time or resources, yeah. you know, to do those type of things, but uh, I kind of spend my time as far as Bigfoot is associated yeah. with the Blue Mountain evidence, not just my dad's, but yeah. Wes Summerlin's and Bill Lowry and Dave Bean and, and Vance Orchard and Dar um, and all those people, and um, I'm collecting the data from it. I'm making comparisons with tracks that everybody has and <clears throat> with pictures and casts. And I'm trying to put together a better picture of what I think the scenario was at that point in time. Yeah. How many animals were there? What sex I think they possibly were? How old I think they possibly were? Yeah. Um, and so I guess you could say I'm more of a historian on the Blue Mountain evidence yeah. uh, more than a, <clears throat> an active researcher. Well, I think that makes you unique, you unique in a great degree. Because a lot of people don't do that. They just go, you know, they, they don't. They don't take the time to catalog like you're doing. And uh, right, you know, um, and I think that we have a lot to learn from these casts, these older casts, yeah. um, that we maybe haven't studied fully. And I think we have a lot to learn from saying that, yeah, this is a monster cast, this Rockfoot cast, but I think this is a female. And I think this is this one, and let me tell you why. Uh, and, and that's kind of, the, you know, some of the stuff we get into in the book as well, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, it's all in the toes if you didn't know, but, uh, you know, so they say, but um, not that I'm opposed to going out and doing some research like that. And, and I'm actually yeah. potentially, and I don't want to say too much about it, but potentially trying to put something together with some other people to return to Deduck's brain sometime God. soon. I was going to ask, what you, is, that, is that you, available? Where do you want to go, man? Let's road trip. <laughs> I want to go. Is right, that well, available? Because the Forest Service... Oh, right. well, D-Duck Spring is not in the watershed. Oh, that's a different one. Um, and D-Duck Spring, actually, and some people don't know this. because It's was in like, Oregon, isn't it? It is in Oregon. That, right. There was this nasty rumor, and I believe it's even in, in Meldrum's book, 
somebody had told him that the site burned down and you couldn't access it anymore. Oh. And it was just like this rumor. It's not true. It's there. There's a public bathroom they built there now, a nice one or whatever. Um, so I hear, I haven't actually been there in 15 years. And so I need to get back there. But I have seen pictures of it recently yeah. uh, from a number of people, Dar Addington and, uh, you know, Jeff, uh, not Jeff, but uh, Cliff Berrickman have sent me pictures from it recently. Um, and uh, another gentleman by the name of Mike, Mike Casey, um, who's in Richland, Washington, uh, have sent me pictures from, yeah. from the, the area. But you can literally drive to d Duck Spring. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's when you get off trail on the backside is when it becomes rough. Okay. And then the watershed boundary is right there. Okay. But it sits, it sits okay. actually, it sits right in front. And you don't go in the watershed boundary, or in the watershed, or you'll get shot or something. Uh, well, you'll get a ticket. <laughs> oh, you know? is that all? Oh, no. So, <laughs> no. and uh, I, I mean, yeah. Yeah. possibly worse for repeat yeah. offenders, you know, because it is trespassing on government land. So, I mean, we need you a could chopper. be arrested for it. We'll, 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 we'll fly out there with the, the Robinson and we'll, there we go. we'll, we'll cruise ball. <laughs> well, well, I know we're running out of time, but yeah. I, for one, thank you for what you're doing yeah. because you, you're just telling your dad's story. Unfortunately, he's not here to tell it well, himself, that's true. which we're yeah. all very sorry about. But And you're, like you said, there's only so many hours in the day. And so I, I'm very appreciative that yeah. you're taking the hours you have available for this because Thank you. this is just fascinating I'm, if for no other reason to go to the sasquatch roundup is just check out this handprint it's just <laughs> fascinating. everyone likes the handprint yeah the that's why you just compare fantastic. it to your own that's you know? it's just think when i was laying in my tent that one night that's the thing that was doing this on my head because i always sleep with my head oh there you go poking against a tent and something's going like that but they were doing that at your toes because yeah. then you would have tasted you know, it uh, soft and chewy no i you know thanks no, for bringing thank me you. on i appreciate yeah. it and you know I, i'm trying to tell my dad's story yes and i'm trying to keep his legacy going yep and i'm trying to get the truth out and I'm trying to dispel yeah. some of the nasty rumors and yeah. you know uh, one of the things I like to say is you know the business of Bigfoot is the business of evidence yeah. yeah and take a look at the evidence from a scientific standpoint and study the evidence and then draw your yeah. conclusions from there mm -hmm. we don't listen to rumors and hearsay yeah. right no perfect wonderful no. statement well perfect. we are out of time and I want to thank you so much once again for coming on the show it's been great and I'm uh, looking forward to spending more time with you and thankful that you're going to be at the Sasquatch Roundup coming up in June. Really, thanks awesome. for having me on, guys. Appreciate yeah. It. Well, my friends, we're out of time. Have to go. Once again, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>